Hello everyone, Shante Skildager here. I am excited to be here with you talking about how you can create engaging learning experiences with the content that you create. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Again, my name is Shante Skildager. I am the founder of this community, the Instructional Design Hangout for Aspiring Instructional Designers, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Instructional Design Company. So I'm super thrilled to be here with you talking to you about creating engaging content. It's kind of what we do, right? So super excited to be sharing this information with you. I love working with content. I really do. It is the heart and the soul of what it is that we do as instructional designers. And it's where we can really make a meaningful impact. And how that works is that we always need to be starting out with our, our analysis, right? So by the way, let me back up for just a second. So this community is really for aspiring instructional designers. So that is who our content is geared for. A lot of times we have experienced instructional designers in the room, which is amazing. So if you are here with us virtually and you have experience as an instructional designer, please share your thoughts, your opinions, and anything that you want to add to this content as we go. But just know that our audience that we're really directing this towards today are our aspiring instructional designers, people who are working on their instructional design skill development. So if it seems like th this is content that you already know because you have experience, well, that would make sense because we are targeting this group of aspiring instructional designers. All right, so all of our great learning experiences that we create as instructional designers really do begin with an analysis of the needs of that particular learning experience. Now, oftentimes needs analysis and needs assessment get used interchangeably, which is not right, but it's what we do. Just like with objectives and outcomes, we often use those terms interchangeably. A needs assessment is really this broader overarching process where we are assessing whether a training is actually needed or not. And if it is needed, who would the audience for that be? Whereas a training analysis, that is after we have already determined that the needs of the train, that we need that training, the analysis is where we then come in and we start to get into the details of what needs to be included in this learning experience. So this is what that looks like for us as instructional designers. We're going to start with getting into who our learners are. We need to know as much information about them as we can. You know, what is their background? What level are they? If we're doing a manager training, are they a new manager? Are they aspiring to be a manager? Have they been managing for some time? Do they have direct reports? Or are they managers of managers? So this is all important information that you would need if you were developing content around the topic of management. So we want to start with an analysis of who our audience is. You know, what prior knowledge do they have? What prior experience do they have? What are the gaps? You know, maybe, you know, they, they've they never been in a manager before. So there's a pretty big gap there between no management experience and then all of a sudden managing a team or even managing a process. So we would need to identify what that gap is. Or maybe it's not a knowledge gap. Maybe there is some sort of performance issue and we need to identify what that performance issue is. So all of this is a part of that analysis process. In addition to that, we also wanna get really clear on what the training objectives are. So this is where we would need to hear from our stakeholders. You know, like what are their objectives for this training? Why did they come to us and ask us to build it? And we need to get really clear on that. A lot of times they come to us and think that they know, but as instructional designers, we put on our um, detective hat and we ask probing questions to get deeper to what the real root cause of whatever this issue is. A lot of times by going through this analysis process, we uncover something totally different than what our stakeholder actually came to us with. So that's all a part of this analysis process. And this is important to us in, in, the, in the way of engagement because we've got to know who our audience is. 
We need to understand where their issues are, what their gaps are, what it is that they need to know in order to create a relevant experience that leaves them feeling like this training that they went through provided value to them. So our analysis is where we're really starting that engagement process before we ever even get in front of the learner because we we have to make sure that we are creating content that's going to resonate with our learners going through our learning experience. Next up, we've got to really dig into these objectives. So in our analysis, we talk to our stakeholder, we get information about them, like what are your objectives for this training from the, their perspective? And then once we're in that learning experience and we're creating it, we need to define really clear objectives that resonate with our participants. So let's talk about three things that we can do that really set us up well with our objectives. First, we want to make sure that we're going to state exactly what it is that our learners can expect that they'll either be able to know or do by the time we finish this learning experience. We also want to make sure that our objectives are SMART. If you've ever worked with any kind of performance goal in your organization, you may already be familiar with SMART. So SMART is an acronym for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time Bound. So we want to be specific about what the learner will either know or be able to do. We need to make sure that we can measure that they know that or they are able to do that. We could do that through mocks, demos, knowledge checks, quizzes, other activities. We also want to make sure that our objectives are actually achievable. <laughs> you know, we don't want to say that, oh, by the end of this, this learning experience, you're going to be able to speak Spanish fluently. Instead, we might be able to say, you will know how to count to 10. You might know your ABCs, right? So we've really got to make sure that we are creating the right expectations with our objectives and the content that we are creating. So achievable. Can it really be achieved in the time that we have? We also want to make sure that it's relevant. So back to that audience analysis, is it relevant to what the learner's needs are? Is it also relevant to the needs of the organization? Are there any KPIs, key performance indicators, or OKRs, or uh, something happening within the organization, like a new ERP system is being implemented, and we're creating a learning experience to help support people's knowledge of how to use that ERP system. So that's related to relevant and then time bound. So is there actually enough time in order for somebody to really become proficient in this objective? So, you know, is, is the expectation that by the end of this learning experience that they can do that? Or is it, hey, you know, we have a certain expectation that by the end of this training or workshop today, you're gonna be able to do X. But then you're going to go out and practice this over the next three months. And then there is this expectation. So we've got to be very specific in our objectives of what we're setting the learner up for. All right. So those are just a few things about our objectives. The third one is, and this is really for us as instructional designers, is that our objectives should drive our content development because we have to build our learning experiences, both the content and the activities that support the learner in their achievement and or demonstration of these objectives. So whatever we all agree on are the objectives for this learning experience, then we're gonna craft content that supports the development of people in those objective areas. So we use our objectives also to ensure that our content is focused um, on what's the, the need to know information. There's nice to know content and there's need to know content. So when you're building your, your learning experience, you're really going to focus it around that need to know content. Our objectives can also help support the instructional strategies that we choose. Now, again, all of this, defining these clear objectives really helps engage our learners by helping them know exactly what to expect by letting them know what they're going to get out of this learning experience, those benefits, how they're going to benefit from this, how they can apply what they are learning to their lives. And when I say their lives, that could be personal, it could be their career aspirations, or maybe it's even in their current job today. So objectives, again, we're, we start engaging people before we even really get into the delivery of the content. Now let's talk about curating content. So curating relevant content is really that process of gathering 
organizing and presenting information and resources, right? So we're crafting, we, we're curating this really wonderful learning experience. So, and remember, everything that we are curating, putting together, crafting needs to align with those objectives. Curating content really plays a significant role in, in enhancing learner engagement because this is where we are tailoring the content to meet the very specific needs of our audience which we determined when we did that audience analysis. And when we do this right, we are not building one size fits all learning experiences. So you can't create a manager's training, for example, and say, hey, this manager training works for the brand new manager, the manager who's been managing for five years, the manager who is the manager of managers or the manager who is running entire divisions, right? That training cannot fit all those different audiences. We have to curate and tailor that learning experience to that specific audience that we analyze the needs of up front. All right, so here are some ways that we can curate content. We can review existing resources if we have access to those. We can work with subject matter experts, which I absolutely love being able to do because they always know so much more information than I do on a topic. So it's really great to be able to work with them. We can do team brainstorming sessions. It could be with the SME. It could be with other members of the L&D team. It could be with different people in the organization across different departments. And we can all come together and brainstorm virtually or in person. We can also do some self-directed study. We could do research books, articles. We can use sources like ChatGPT, OpenAI, right? So there are a lot of different resources that we can use to help us curate these tailored learning experiences for our, for our amazing audiences that we serve as instructional designers. Now, Everyone's build style is a little bit different. So what I'm going to share with you right now might be very different than somebody else, another instructional designer in this group. So just know that the way that you build your learning experience is going to vary. There's not necessarily a right way or a wrong way, or maybe there are some wrong ways, but everybody's way of doing things is a little bit different. So I'm going to tell you about mine. Personally, whenever I sit down to create content for a learning experience, I like to begin with a mind map or um, sticky notes, something like that, just so that I can get my creative juices going. Then depending on how I started a, a, a sticky note activity or a mind map, I then like to create an outline. And then what I do in my outline is that I like to layer in my instructional strategies and even map all my content and my outline to the different objectives of that learning experience. So this allows me to create a visual roadmap of what it is that I'm creating. So I can step back and I can get the big picture. I can look at what I've got and go, you know what, that's going to work for my brand new manager training that I am creating. And then from there, you know, based on the content that I have, based on what the success metrics of that learning experience are, I'm going to choose some instructional strategies. Now, these are by no means all the instructional strategies available to you, but we are here together for a very short amount of time, so I can't cover everything. So I'm going to give you some of just a, a handful of these to work with. So up front, we've got experiential learning. This is exactly like it sounds. This is where the learners acquire knowledge and skills through action, participating, reflection, doing things. And then since adult learners really bring a lot of experience, you want to use activities like case studies, problem solving, and simulations, like really get them hands-on and involved in this learning experience. Next up, we've got collaborative learning, which is where the learners collaborate together. Maybe you put them in a group, either virtually, online, or maybe you put have them drop content into an e-learning chat board or something like that. And you, you'll give them a problem to solve. Maybe you ask them to complete a task or maybe you ask them to create something. And then the last option is self-directed learning. This is where the learners are taking ownership of their own learning. They need to identify what resources they need and create their own learning plan and take action on it. Just like many of you that are here in our hangout, our instructional design hangout for aspiring instructional designers, 
many of you have taken ownership of your learning. You're, you're doing self-directed learning. You're here right now in this session learning, or maybe you've already mapped out a plan of like, these are the skills that I need to develop as an instructional designer, and maybe you're already working on those. So those are all examples of self-directed. Now, all of these you could use in a single learning experience. You could create a learning experience where there would be components of experiential, where you bring them, you have them uh, learn through participating. You could have parts of a learning experience that are collaborative where you put them in some sort of group activity. And then you can even help learners formulate some sort of action plan that they will implement and take ownership of uh, to implement on their own outside of the learning experience. So this is where you could like bring in a lot of different variety and the more variety that you can bring that's relevant and supports that learning experience, the better. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about organizing the content. So we've talked about the doing the analysis. We've talked about defining the objectives. I told you a little bit about my process of where I create an outline or a mind map, and then I layer in the instructional strategies and map the objectives. Well, after all of that, I would script. I would create my script of what my learning experience is going to be. And really, it's not a fair name to call it a script because a script sounds like this is something that somebody has to follow exactly. But I really, I create the narrative of what my learning experience is. I think about it in my head of how I would lay it out. I have a visual idea, nothing that is set in stone, but a visual idea of what slides might look like or what the flow might look like. After I've created that narrative or that script narrative, then I want to look at the structure and the organization of the content that I created, because this also has a very, very significant impact on learner engagement. So again, when organizing that content, we're still thinking about our objectives. Remember, our, our objectives are like a lighthouse that's guiding us and our learners to their final destination. So whatever flow my objectives are in, that is also the flow that my content should be in. So the objectives and the content will follow the same order in flow. So we want to make sure that we sequence, I can't even say the word. We want to make sure that we are sequen sequencing our content uh, so that it makes sense. And there are a variety of different strategies for that too. You could do part to whole or whole to part, or you could you start with a problem that people, you want them to start engaging with and trying to solve. If I have any teachers that are here with us today, if you want to drop in an explanation of what part to whole or whole to part is, I would love that. Um, also, we want to make sure that our content is relevant. Again, we've got to, we've got to keep making connections for our learners to real world applications. Like, why does this matter to you? What are you going to get out of this? How is this going to help you at work? How is this going to help you in your personal life? How is this going to help you reach your career goals? Whatever that is, we got to keep uh, making those connections for our learners. And then the last thing that I have here is chunking. We've got to make sure that we break our content into manageable chunks of information. So whenever you are chunking your content, and what I mean by chunking it is like creating little learning blocks. It could be you're going to deliver content for 10 minutes and then you're going to pause. And then you're going to deliver content for five minutes and you're going to pause. So each of those content deliveries, that's a chunk of content. So when you ch whenever you are chunking your content, you are building in brain breaks and points of application and reflection. So this means that we are creating learner pauses so that our learners can do something with the content that we just shared with them. That could be application, that could be reflecting on how this could be used, anything like that. There is this uh, principle called primacy recency. And that is how you create more high learning episodes, how you can enhance retention. And chunking is something that supports that. One of the biggest mistakes that I see people make when building a learning experience is talking at people versus giving room for people to apply, try, and discuss. Now, sadly, what I am doing right here is talking at you. Um, but that is the format of these live streams. 
But the good news is, is that we have people in our chat that are here to engage with you, support you. So that is one of the ways that we can create some interaction. Now, again, chunking the content and building in brain breaks um, can help us not talk at people because that's not very engaging. So we want to make sure that we have some chunks along the way. The other thing that we want to consider are adult learners. As adult learners, we have different needs than children. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some overlaps between kids and adults in how they like to learn. So don't think that one is exclusive of the other. But what we're saying is just focus on the adult right now. So what I want to do is very quickly introduce you to Malcolm Knowles' Four Principles of Andragogy. So whenever we're talking andragogy, that's just a, a fancy big word for adult learning, okay? So let's talk about what our adult learners need. They want to be involved in the learning process. So whenever you're thinking about your instructional strategies or how you're sequencing your content or even chunks or how you're going to pull people into that learning experience, purposely and with intention, build in places to involve your adult learner. Adults come with a vast amount of experience too. So it be intentional and think about how can I bring in my learner's experience? So here at the beginning of this workshop, I addressed people who I said, if you're an experienced instructional designer, please share. I've made the comment, if you're a teacher, please explain part to whole or whole to part, right? If you have questions, put those in here because your questions, people can also learn from your experiences. So when you are bringing in the experience of a learner, that's not just so that their voice is in the room, but most often we learn better and more when we hear from a variety of different people with a variety of different experiences. The other thing that we want to consider, again, is keep making the, the connection to how this is relevant to that learner, what they're going to get out of it. And then number four is problem-centered. We love to solve problems. So as much as we can give people a problem to solve, the better. It's one of the things that I really like about scenarios. Whenever we present a scenario, people have to problem solve, like what would be the best choice in that scenario? And then this last piece that we have here in the very center is variety, right? Don't do the same thing over and over and over and over. That can make something that was really great the first couple of times boring and no longer interesting. So we've got to switch it up. Our brain is a mean, lean uh, learning machine and it will be attracted to something new like, Whoa, oh, that's great. But if you keep repeating it, then the brain's like, ah, seen that before, not so interesting. So we want to make sure that we are bringing in as much uh, variety as we can. That variety could be in the form of different technologies, different resources, different activities. You know, maybe sometimes it's a person that is talking via a video. Maybe another time it's reading an article. Maybe another time it's some sort of group activity. So just changing it up and having some variety. One of the, the things that uh, can get boring about e-learning is if it's slide after slide, you read and click, read and click, read and click. So you've got to bring in some variety in how you are educating people online, in person, virtually, all those, all of those things. So just create, just keep that in mind. Okay, and then after you've done all of that, you've you've done your analysis, you've uh, defined your objectives, you've thought about how you're going to sequence, chunk, make the content relevant, your instructional strategies, you've built your content. The next thing that we need to do is go and check our content to see if we actually did what we said we were going to do. Our objectives that we worked with our stakeholder to create, did we actually deliver on those through our content? Can we explicitly find the supports in our content that address that objective, right? This is often another myth that I see instructional designers do. We'll build the objectives at the beginning. We might put it on a slide and then we just take off building the learning experience and we never come back to make sure that we actually addressed all those objectives. I mean, it would make sense that we addressed it, but we often just miss it. Because whenever you're building slide by slide by slide, it could take forever to build a single slide and you could be off on a tangent before you even know. 
you also want to check to make sure it's engaging. Like if I have a three hour training, I'm looking to see how many activities do I have in here? Do I just have two activities in three hours? I sure hope not. I want to have people uh, really engaging with that content as much as possible. And if the if we're in a modality that allows for it. I also want them connecting with each other and connecting with, with the facilitator. So based on your modality for delivery, whether it's online, it's instructor-led, instructor-led virtual, it's an e-learning course sitting in an LMS, you've got to assess how much engagement is there. You also want to check, does it meet the needs of adult learners? Are we allowing them to be involved in the process? Do they get to share their experience? Have we explained how it's relevant? Um, was there a way for them to work on a problem to solve? And then this last part is, do the activities reinforce learning or behavior change? And what I mean by this is that we've really got to be intentional with the selection of the activities that we are doing. Sometimes people like to do activities because they're fun, but they have no relationship to the content. That's okay for an icebreaker or something like that, just to warm up a room if you're delivering live. But beyond that, we really need to be creating activities that foster and support knowledge acquisition and skill development. So we just want to do a quick check of all of these things, because all of these things influence how engaged our learner will be with the content and with that learning experience. All right. So like I said, I really powered through this very quickly. That was a lot, a lot, a lot of information in a very short time. So just as a quick recap, we said that when, when crafting engaging content, we need to assess the needs of our learners through the needs analysis. We want to make sure that we have clear objectives, that they are smart, that they are guiding the development of our content, that we want to curate content that is engaging, relevant, has a logical sequence that is chunked into smaller segments to help support the brain's acquisition of that content. We want to choose instructional strategies with intention. Those strategies should really support and um, really drive home different behaviors and uh, knowledge and skill development. We also want to make sure that our content is organized in a way that uh, that flows, that doesn't cause confusion, that would have that logical next step. We want to consider our adult learners and what their needs are, involving them, making sure that it's relevant, giving them the opportunity to share their experience, solve problems. And then we want to check our content to make sure that it does all the things that we promised it would do at the start of that build. But what I would like to do is to hear from you all, which of the steps here in crafting engaging content is one that you might want to try or try to do differently if you have any experience with these already. So which of these would you like to start working on? Again, if you're an aspiring instructional designer, you can't do all of these things at one time and be great at them. But what is one thing here that you might like to start working on and developing your skill around or developing your ID muscle around so that you feel more confident doing it? So drop that here. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And we will be back soon with some more content for our aspiring instructional designers. Bye, everyone.